man I was going to tell you about in 1905, Robert Porterfield. My grandmother, Gladys Good Boswell, who was born and is buried here, only about a half mile from here, used to go up to the Barter Theater in Abingdon, Virginia, which Mr. Porterfield started. Mr. Porterfield started this in the 1930s after going to New York as an actor in the 1920s. And he came back home to the little town of Abingdon with a wild bunch of hippies, unkempt, unclean, why the women in his group even smoked. This was not exactly a hand-in-glove fit with the white-glove ladies of Abingdon. Yet he said, we have a plan, and our plan is for you to get together and have shows put on because we know you don't have any veg we know you don't have any money but you do have vegetables you do have even tobacco you do have things that we could eat and we're all starving so the first night in 1933 in june somebody traded in a pig to get in the door they tied up the pig outside and let it squeal like a barker on the streets and then one man came in with a cow he milked just enough of the cow for a glass of milk, and he handed it to the ticket taker, and she said, Sir, this is just enough for you to get in, and here's your ticket. Now, your wife is still standing over here by your cow. Now, should I save a ticket next to you? And he said, No, she's going to have to milk her own ticket. And it went on like that, night after night. Turtles got loose in the lobby. One man was too cheap to hand over the calf, the rope that the calf was tied to. He gave him the calf, but he kept the rope. The calf got into a theater like this, and showtime was delayed for five minutes. So the barter theater went on year after year after year. And in 1971, Mr. Robert Porterfield died. Today they say, if you go into the barter theater, sometimes you might see a man with a white sweater. They say that's the ghost of Robert Porterfield, that he loved the Barter Theater so much that he's still coming back to see it. Well, I wrote about that in my book, Beach to Bluegrass, and I also wrote about it in a book called The Marble and Other Ghost Tales of Tennessee and Virginia. And in The Marble, I found a story from just down, just a couple doors away from where we are. You know, if, if you look all around, we have a Greenville in every state. But this is the only one with a big old giant E in the middle of it. Of course, it was named for Nathaniel Green, but that doesn't keep the people here in Greenville from putting the green in everything, like green is the city's color scheme. But of course, green is all you could call the green room over at the General Morgan Inn with the green drapes and the green carpet and the green fabric. It is the only room also at the General Morgan Inn that is haunted by a spoon-snatching waitress. They say that if you put the knife down, put the fork down, put the spoons down and set the table, everything looks good until you turn around and the spoon is gone. They say that is the ghost of Green Room Grace, a waitress who died 75 years ago, and she's come back to reset the tables. So hotels and schools are often places where you can find ghosts. My favorite ghost tale comes from a little town up in Russell County, Virginia called Honeaker. When I first heard of this place, I thought it was known as Honaker, but it's Honeaker. You gotta learn how to pronounce town names when you're in this area. It's in Virginia, it's Buchanan County where Grundy, Virginia is, even though it was named for President James Buchanan. It's Withville, not Withyville up in Virginia. And it's Appalachia, not Appalachia. If you go down to Alabama, they'll say Appalachia. You go to Maryland, you'll say Appalachia. But how do I know it's Appalachia? Well, of course, it's named for the Spanish, named it for an Indian tribe. But when I talked to a Kiwanis club up in Clintwood, Virginia, the cook came and she said, honey, that ain't how it got its name. And I said, well, how did it get its name? She says, well, there's this man and a woman carrying on one day. And she looked at him and she says, you better settle down or I'm going to throw an apple at you. <laughs> Honeaker, Virginia, is the story of a man named A.P. Baldwin. 
A.P. Baldwin was a principal for 30, over 30 years at Honeacre High School. He smoked so much that he had a hard time getting up the stairs. He smoked so much that his fingers turned yellow. He liked to joke about as much as he liked to smoke because he joked all the time. Now, when he died in 1981, Mr. A.P. Baldwin, the ghost stories began at Honeacre High School. The kids would even sneak into the school at night because they said that at that point, in a room a little bigger than this, they could see what looked like red tips of lit cigarettes floating around, especially around 9 o'clock at night. Well, then one came this legendary evening in the 1990s. Two teachers and a few students walked in to the gym just after 7.30, just after baseball practice. The lights were on, but all of a sudden the lights began to flicker, going almost completely out except for one light right above the high jump mat. And that one light, a teacher said, turned blood red. Next came sightings of something up here in the balcony. And what showed up appeared to be a huge silhouette of a, it looked like a, a man wearing a trench coat, and it looked like he was smoking. He was real tall, one of the teachers said, and we could see coming out of his mouth the glow of a cigarette. You could see that little red glow. The teacher said that the silhouette went from one end of the batting cage all the way to the other almost in an instant. The students, they screamed and ran out of the gym. The teachers, meanwhile, they ran up to the balcony to investigate what happened to the smoking apparition. One teacher said he found ashes on the floor where the ghost had stood. To this day, nobody can explain why at night they see these red tips of what looks like lit cigarettes floating around the AP Baldwin Gymnasium. But they happen to believe that that is the sign of the principal who never left school. In another book I wrote called Haunts of Virginia's Blue Ridge Highlands, I talk about a school in Christiansburg, Virginia, that was haunted by these ladies who killed their nephew and killed their niece. And they wore funeral-like fashions. They wore black all the time. They called them the Black Sisters. Today, they say the custodians will say that they can hear them marching up and down the hallways. Now, Christiansburg was named for William Christian, who was a brother-in-law, Patrick Henry. And William Christian was another one of our founders in what became the New River and Holston River Valleys, stretching from Virginia down into Tennessee. And another one that, that has connections up to that area of William Christian is the Preston family. The Preston family uh, has ties back to the Smithfield Plantation at Blacksburg, Virginia, at the Virginia Tech campus. The Preston family has ties to over at the Exchange Place in Kingsport. The Preston family also has ties to what is known as the Martha Washington Inn in Abingdon, Virginia. The Martha Washington Inn was built in 1832 as a private home for the Preston family. Francis Preston, who grew up at Blacksburg, Virginia, married a sweet young girl. He was 27 and an attorney. She was 14 years old. But she was more than just some typical 14-year-old girl. Sarah Buchanan Campbell. She was William Campbell's daughter. William Campbell was the man who led the march of the Overmountain men down to the Battle of Kings Mountain. She was also a daughter of Madam Henry Russell. Madam Russell was a sister of Patrick Henry, the man who said, give me liberty or give me death. So the Preston family lived in this house at what is now across from the Barter Theater in Abingdon until 1858 when the house was sold and became known as the Martha Washington College for Girls. Now the Martha Washington College for Girls had all kinds of strict rules. The boys from up at Emory and Henry College, they really wanted to meet those girls at the Martha Washington College because it was all boys there at Emory and Henry and all girls down at Martha. Now the boys would write notes, but the only way the girls could write back is if the college president could read what was in those notes. The girls were not allowed to drink cherry Cokes. And even though we have a lot of trains that go on the main line from Greenville to Johnson City and on up to Bristol and Abingdon and as far north as Roanoke, the girls were not allowed to wave at the train conductors because that was considered a sign of flirting. So maybe in the midst of all of these, in the midst of all these rules, it became no surprise that the Martha Washington has attracted so many ghost tales. 
One is the story of when the Martha became a Civil War hospital and a man was gunned down and his bloodstains would just never would disappear. One is the story of a man who burned down the Washington County, Virginia courthouse and his horse is still running around looking for him after he got shot out of the saddle. And one is the story of Beth. You know, Bill Clinton has stayed at the Martha Washington. Jimmy Carter has stayed there. Elizabeth Taylor stayed there. But the most famous person that seems to be attached to the mighty Martha Washington Inn is this girl named Beth. And according to the stories, she was a student nurse when the war broke out. Especially in 1864, when General Stoneman's raid went through Abingdon on up to the salt deposits of Saltville, which was the salt capital of the Confederacy. At that time, Beth had a boyfriend, a Union spy, and she had a violin as well. And he said, play something, Beth, I'm going, I'm going to die. And she began to play her violin. Now later she died of typhoid fever. Today they say, if you go to the Martha Washington Inn on a full moon night, you can still hear her playing that violin. Once there was a man who was staying at the Martha Washington Inn, and he came running downstairs, and he told the desk clerk, I've heard it, I've heard it, I've heard your musical ghost. Well, the desk clerk looked at him and said, Sir, what? He says, I've heard it. I'm hearing your violin music. It's a full moon night. She said, Sir, now come on, just calm down. That's just a story that we have in the brochures. We're not even sure if it's true. And he says, uh, No, I'm hearing it. So she went upstairs. And so did the bellhop, and so did one of the maids. And they were all standing outside the man's room. And the th staff, the three people, were all looking at each other. And they're like, how do we get this guy to calm down? And then they began to hear it. They heard this faint sound of violin music. Very, very faint. And they all looked at each other with wonder. They thought, what is going on here? There really is a ghost. We're hearing it. It's Beth. And then the night auditor ran back downstairs, and they realized that the man who called was staying in this room. And in this room was a concert violinist scheduled to play later that night at Emory and Henry College. I thank you all very much for having me today. There are a lot of historical figures, many interesting stories to tell, but one of the most easily recognizable figures from East Tennessee is a man named David Crockett. Here to tell us a little bit more about David Crockett is Mark Hallback from the Davy Crockett Birthplace State Park. Thank you, Meg. Folks, I don't use a uh, microphone because the good Lord gave me voice. And uh, I have been blessed in my life to be working for Tennessee State Parks, maintaining the heritage of this great state. And within the state of Tennessee, our state parks, I am working on what is one of the smallest geographical state parks in the state. But folks, we have one of the biggest stories in this nation, David Crockett. David Crockett was born on August 17, in the year 1786, at Limestone, Tennessee, where the big Limestone Three joins the waters of the Noah Church. He was born the fifth child to John and Rebecca Crockett. John had come across the mountains to his father and his father, and uh, they were guided across the Cumberland Gap by none other than Daniel Boone. David lived in the area of Limestone, Tennessee. He says in his autobiography that he was still in dresses. They dressed the boys in shift shirts and everything. I guess when they grew up and they got up to about their knees, they gave them another one. But he says that he was still in dresses when they left and moved to the area around Morristown, Tennessee. It was 
was there, that David Crockett grew to the ripe old age of 12, 12 years old, when his father sold him into indentured servitude to work for a man on a cattle drive going up into uh, Virginia. At the tender age of 12, he took, up on, took off on this trip. He did such a good job that when they reached, I believe it was Rock Ridge County in Virginia, when they reached Rock Ridge County, the man did not want to pay young David the wages that he was owed. They stopped in a tavern and David went up to a few people in the tavern and he relates his, his problem to these uh, teamsters and they got together and they went and encouraged this man to pay young Crockett the wages that he was owed. And at 12 years of age, Crockett took off in the dead of winter and he walked home from Rockbridge County, Virginia. And when he got home, gave the money that he had earned to his father. Twelve years old. This was the first of many journeys that young Crockett was going to be going on. It's, I guess he was starting to stretch that itchy foot because he was never able in all of his life, for the rest of his life, he was never able to truly settle down. About two years later, Crockett's 13, well, a year later, he's 13, maybe 14 years old, Crockett He's realized his father goes into a deal. He does a little bit of bartering. He's using trade goods. And he trades with a, a local schoolmaster to arrange for Crockett to get some schooling. That's the way they did it back then. It was like a barter theater. They just traded trade goods, you know, for the, for the uh, whatever service that they needed. But Crockett goes to school, and in the first week, there's a bully in the school that decides to take Crockett on. And uh, he's going to whip him up a little bit. So David Crockett, he says in his autobiography that he whipped this boy Crockett for his insolence, that he was going to beat me up. So Crockett whipped him Crockett for his insolence, but he is deathly afraid that now he's been involved in a fight in school that his father is going to be giving him some of the same. So he arranges with one of his brothers to engage in a lot. The brothers go to school and tell the schoolmaster, well, young David, you know, he can home and he's sick, right? And then uh, when the boy comes home, you know, Brock comes home, he's spending his days in the woods, and he's like, when dad said, well, how things go in school with it? Well, everything went okay. So with this little lie went on for a few days, but this fate went out it, it was found out. David, fearing us for sure, looking for lying to his dad about this thing, he runs away from home. He joins on another cattle drive, this time going all the way up. His journey carries him all the way up into Maryland. When he was in Maryland, he actually considered the possibility of joining one of the ships that fly the trade routes between Europe and the United States working as a cabin boy. But that plan didn't work out. He stayed away from home for about three years. Now, this is in a young man in his growingest years. We're talking about mid-teens. Well, he comes back home, he gets a little homesick, he realizes, well, I'm going to have to face the old dad. I'm going to have to take my dust. So he works his way home, and he goes into the tavern. By this time, his father was working the Crockett Tavern in Morristown, Tennessee. He walks into the tavern, and you have to imagine this. The tavern is dimly lit with candles. He pulls his hat down over his eye and he pulls his collar up around his neck and he's sitting there wondering, you know, what kind of response he's going to get. And no one in the tavern, not even his family, no one recognizes him until somebody asks him a question. And when he answers the question, one of his sisters recognizes his voice. Well, there's a great homecoming. My goodness gracious, Dave is alive. We were so feared for you, son. So feared for you. David, he was so glad to find that his father was more pleased with his being home again and being safe that he did not lose his temper over the adventures that he had been engaged in. But I imagine that it had a little bit to do with his father decided not to whip up on his son when he looks at this young boy who was just a short lad when he left, and now he has grown to his full adult height. He's got the beginnings of a beard, perhaps his voice is lowered a little bit, and he reaches in his pocket. He takes some money that he had earned over the three years and hands it to his father. That's what people did back in those days. 
David Crockett now in his late teens, he realizes his lack of education is at the root of all of his misfortune. He has to get some education. There's a man that he's, that lived down in the Morristown area, his name is John Kennedy. He had a son who was keeping school in the region. And David pressed this man to make a deal that he would work for it. And in exchange for his labor and some food, uh, in exchange for his labor, that he would be provided the lessons. This deal went, this, this exchange went for about six months. And in that time, it provided all the formal schooling that David Crockett ever had in the entirety of his life. And it totaled a sum of approximately 100 days. Well, David took three little little white even less and did just barely a little siphon in the three majors of, 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 of working milk. And he's still wanting to get married. He wants to find a way you know, to find a wife. That was why he went to school. He's feeling really sorry for himself. He's riding across the country and he knows an old Dutch widow. She had his daughter that Crockett says is as ugly as a stone fence. But he stops to visit with her. And the young lady seeing Crockett's plight and everything, seeing that he's kind of sad, she says, if you will, but come to a corner shutting, I'll introduce you to a family who has a series of daughters that they are all true beauties. Well, David Crockett goes along with this. He says, well, okay, all the time, fear of it. Is she really thinking that, that she's going to be the one to enter into sin with me? But he goes to the corner shutting, and sure enough, there he meets a young lady that is an absolute vision of loveliness. She is even-tempered. She is engaging. She is the most beautiful girl that David Crockett had ever seen in his life, and he immediately fell in love with her. Her name was Mary Finley. But everybody that knew her, the family and friends, everyone called her Holly. Holly Finley. David was immediately smitten with her, fell head over heels in love, and in less than a year, they were wed. David tried to set up home, thinking he had his position made. I'm set for the world. I had a wife, rented some land, paid a high rent, getting paid little. But they, they set up a home. You had to have him children. Soon, Crockett had figured out that he was much better at increasing his family than he was in increasing his fortune, and he knew that he was not satisfied with a farmer's life. And then she flipped, started working on it again. He and Mary, they moved out to Lincoln County. They lived in Lincoln County shortly thereafter, moved to the Bean Creek area in uh, Franklin County. And something happened. That is where fate truly began to enter into David Crockett's life. He is now the father of two sons. His, his wife is pregnant with her third child. And an incident happens in northern Alabama that is going to change his life. Fort Mills. The Red Men in northern Alabama attacked Fort Mills and one of the greatest massacres that has never been recorded in any history book that I'm aware of they slaughtered to a man, every person in the fort, men, women, and children, over 500 people were slain at the, at the massacre at Fort Mills. The militia was called up to go into the areas of northern Alabama to seek revenge and to provide for the safety of the other settlers that were in the vicinity. David Crockett, like many of the young men in the area, he joined the militia. And the armies that were brought to bear in northern Alabama, this was the beginnings of the Creek Indian Wars. And the man who was in charge of all the armies was another great Tennessee historical figure that started his law practice in Jonesboro, Tennessee, a man by the name of Andrew Jackson. That is where Andrew Jackson and David Price first Met. Actually, the meeting of Andrew Jackson and David Crockett is kind of interesting because there was a there was a low officer, probably a lieutenant, I'm not really sure what the man's name was, but uh, 
he was complaining that he had been put in charge, in command of the militia, the volunteers. And he thought that this was just a rabble, an undisciplined group of people, and he did not appreciate it, that he was going to go to the great general and make this complaint about it. And David said, well, I'll go see what the old general has to say. I'll go with him. And he goes, and the man is recounting this complaint about having uh, command over all of these lowly militiamen, this rabble. And Jackson interrupts him and says, sir, you need, before you give an order, you have to bring it to maturity. And then when you give an order, you need to see it through, no matter what the consequences. And that was all he had to say. Well, David goes back into the company of the young men, the lowly privates and everything that he's working with, and they say, well, what did the general say? What did the general say? And Crocker said, well, fellas, as near as I can figure, he says, be sure you're right, and then go ahead. That became the motto of David Crocker. That was on the cover of his autobiography, and that was the first time that it ever came. That it ever came up. It was something that spread through the army, and this young, lowly private scout in the army began having some notoriety. You know, of being able to cut something down to its absolute essence. Well, David Crockett served in the militia, fighting in the Greek Indian Wars. But as fate would have it, his wife, pregnant with her third child, she delivers the child. It's a young girl, David's first daughter. They named her Margaret, but much like her mother, they called her Holly. But as a result of that pregnancy, young Mary Finley died, leaving David destitute. Poor, three small children, one an infant. And single parenthood was not a luxury that could be well afforded in these days. But there was a woman in the area that he knew. She was the widow, the young widow of a man who had been killed in the Indian Wars. Her name was Elizabeth Patton. She had two children by David Crockett. She had two children by her previous husband. And then they got married, and together they had three more children. David tells a story about one time he was out in the yard chopping wood, and he hollered in the house. Elizabeth, your kids and my kids are trying to kill our kids. But, uh, but David had uh, appointed himself so well when he was serving in the militia that a position came open in the militia for, for the leadership position. And as was the, the, the manner in those days, the militias elected their officers. David was elected into a position, an officer position in the militia. He worked his way up into the rank of where he got the rank of Colonel Crockett. He was never in the regular army. It was in the militia that he got the, the rank of Colonel. Well, an office opened up for a magistrate, and David was encouraged by the people in the area to run for this position, uh, run for the office of magistrate. And though he had only 100 days of formal education, could barely read and write, his wife, you know, had passed away, Elizabeth, do the petition. She would do the writing of the paperwork, but David ran for the position of magistrate and he won. And an interesting side note to David Crockett's life in all the decisions that he made as a magistrate, not one decision was ever overturned or even appealed because he based all of his decisions on the good common sense that everyone could identify with, and this endeared him to the people. He served as a magistrate for a couple of years. The position comes over to the Tennessee State Legislature. David Crockett is again encouraged to run for the Tennessee State Legislature. He runs for the office. He gets elected. He's serving in the Tennessee State Legislature, and this is where the driving force of David Crockett's political career comes to bear. The previous speaker was talking about the State of Franklin and how the, the formation of the State of Franklin 
serving for the cadets of the state of North Carolina for the Revolutionary War. This is important. The squatters, the pioneers, the people who had come over the mountain, the over mountain people, in the years prior to the Revolutionary War and had extremely been working their way west, when they when they, they did not have title to their lands, 